Hello and welcome to our second event for the month of May and especially today, May 12th, which is the International Day for Multiple Chemical Sensitivities. Today we remember Sophia, a member and volunteer whose life was ended by medical assistance in dying on February 22nd, 2022, all because there was neglect to provide healthy housing. Today is an important day to remember why we educate, create awareness, advocate, and work for housing and recognition. There remains much work to be done and we invite you to join us on this journey. The presentation today titled Multiple Chemical Sensitivity, Top 10 Myths has been developed and will be presented by Dr. John Malott. All events for the month of May are dedicated to Dr. Lynn Marshall. Dr. Lynn Marshall has had a tremendously successful career as a physician spanning over 55 years working in comprehensive family medicine, occupational medicine, environmental medicine, general practice psychotherapy, hypnotherapy, and epidemiological research. She was the recipient of numerous awards in environmental medicine. Lynn was an advisor to Asaki Hack, where she provided her knowledge, expertise, and support to help build the association to the organization that it is today. We will now observe a moment of silence in her memory. Asa Kihak acknowledges the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation whose traditional and unceded territory we are upon today. We would like to pay tribute to these indigenous people and to their descendants. We now bring to you the presentation for the day titled Multiple Chemical Sensitivity Top 10 Myths on this May 12th the International Awareness Day for Multiple Chemical Sensitivity. We now present to you Dr. John Malott. Is the attribution of symptoms to exposures to common environmental chemicals false or true? If it's false, MCS must be a psychological condition. But if the attribution is true, then there has to be a significant amount of supportive evidence for biological mechanisms which explain it. These are the top 10 arguments made against MCS. Are they true or false? First of all, there's no accepted consensus definition for MCS. MCS doesn't exist. Reacting to structurally unrelated chemicals is not explainable biologically. Symptom provocation from low dose exposures to common chemicals is not consistent with classical toxicology. MCS cannot be explained by known pathophysiological mechanisms. MCS patients do not have a hypersensitive sense of smell. Attributing multiple symptoms to low level chemical exposures is just a misperception. The evidence that MCS is caused by psychiatric conditions is strong. Provocation of symptoms from chemical exposures is a conditioned response and MCS patients should be encouraged to increase chemical exposures. Are these 10 statements true or false? Many individuals observe sensitivity to common chemicals. We see sensitivity to chemicals generally in the population like in migraines and asthma. For example, 60% of asthmatics are provoked by odors like from perfumes and cleaning sprays. And 70% of migraine patients report that headaches are triggered by the odors of perfumes, paints, and gasoline, and other chemicals. Migraine headaches and asthma are frequently comorbid, meaning they occur together, and occurring together is more likely to occur than just by chance or coincidence. That's what comorbid means, that they're associated. Their occurrence together is bidirectional, which means if you have one of these conditions, for example, if you're an asthmatic, you're more likely to be a migraine person too, or vice versa. 
This is because they share biological mechanisms or pathways. There's an overlap in what's happening to these people. One common denominator for migraines and asthma is sensitivity to chemical odors. So when we look at multiple chemical sensitivity or MCS, almost 50% of people with this diagnosis have comorbid migraines and 70% of them are asthmatic. Almost 90% of MCS patients report adverse effects from exposure to fragranced consumer products, just like the asthmatics and the migraine people. Most of the cases of MCS come from a non-industrial work environment. Most of the cases do not from an industrial exposure. 75% of the MCS cases associate the onset with observed exposures to increased indoor air pollution. The definition of multiple chemical sensitivity was made in 1999 by a consensus of experts and was validated independently in 2001. Symptoms are reproducible with repeated chemical exposures. The condition is chronic. Low levels of exposure, lower than previously or commonly tolerated, results in the manifestation of symptoms and the symptoms improve or go away completely when these incitants are removed. The responses occur to multiple chemically unrelated substances and the symptoms involve multiple organ systems. That consensus definition with the six criteria was validated. That is proven to be able to pick out MCS patients from non-MCS patients way back in 2001 by the Environmental Health Research Unit at the University of Toronto. And for the last 20 years, they have remained unrefuted. And they're commonly used in multiple research studies on MCS. Myth number one, there's no accepted consensus definition for MCS. It's a myth. Prevalence is a measurement of how commonly a condition occurs in the population. There are many individuals who have observed sensitivities to common chemicals. The prevalence in the population depends on how the question is posed. One question is, are you more intolerant than normal or do you attribute immediate reactions to chemical exposures? And when asked in this way, the prevalence is between 9 and 16 percent in multiple studies in Canada, the United States, Germany, Sweden, Finland, Australia, Korea, and Japan. If we ask, have you been diagnosed with MCS by a doctor, the prevalence rates fall to a half to almost 4 percent. And middle-aged women are the most common group. These numbers have increased in the past 10 years Number one, more intolerant than normal by over 200%. And number two, doctor diagnosed MCS by over 300%. The numbers are going up for both people who say they are intolerant to chemicals and people diagnosed by doctors with MCS. The prevalence of sensitivity to fragrance products was studied in the American population. And they found that almost 35% of the population had experienced one or more adverse health effects. That's a third of the population. Almost 19% had respiratory problems and 8% actually get asthma. The nervous system is the most common system involved. Almost 16% of people report migraine headaches, 7% neurological problems, and almost 6% complain of cognitive problems. Just over 10% of the people who complain of being sensitive to fragrances have skin problems. Sensitivity to fragranced products clearly has an impact. 23% of the people who claim to be sensitive to fragrances have been prevented from going someplace because of an exposure. 20% of them reported that when they entered a business and smelled the fragrance products, they left as quickly as possible. 18% of these people aren't able or are reluctant to use the toilets in public places because when they go into these places, there's an air freshener or deodorizer or some kind of scented product that they can be exposed to. 14% of them 
are unable or reluctant to wash their hands with soap in a public place because they know or suspect that the soap is going to be fragranced. And 15% of the people who complain of fragrance sensitivity say there's a problem with exposures in the work environment that has caused them to become sick or lose work days or even their job. Prevalence studies in North America, Europe, Asia and Australia are consistent every year it's checked. The numbers are pretty similar and they're going up. The impact on quality of life is significant. MCS is a unique public health problem. That MCS does not exist is a myth. The question is why? Regarding exposures to pollution, 90% of our time is spent indoors. Compared to the outdoor air, indoor air is two to five times more contaminated with chemicals. And the majority of these chemicals are volatile and semi-volatile organic compounds. Volatile meaning that they're in a gas state at room temperature. Usually the levels of each individual chemical are below the permissible exposure limits, which means if that limit is not exceeded, it will not generally cause adverse effects. But that doesn't account for real life exposures. There's always a mixture. There's many chemicals in the air. They interact with each other. They can have additive and synergistic effects on the human body. So the toxicity of the indoor air chemical exposures is not really well understood yet. The sources of these chemicals are building materials, furnishings, especially new furnishings like furniture, carpets and drapes, and human behaviors, the things that we bring into the house and use, such as personal care products, soaps and shampoos, fabric softeners, and common household products, cleaners and deodorizers, etc. A study was performed to identify the ingredients of 25 common household products. They looked at air fresheners, laundry detergents, fabric softeners, dryer sheets, disinfectants, dish detergents, all-purpose cleaners, soaps, hand sanitizers, lotions, deodorants, and shampoos. Many of the studied products are commonly used top sellers. And what they found was 133 different volatile organic compounds emitted by these products. The average number of chemicals emitted for each product was 17. These volatile organic compounds also generate secondary pollutants. For example, if there's ozone outside, some will get into your house and it'll mix with some of these indoor pollutants to produce other chemicals, such as formaldehyde. Traditional toxicology is the study of poisons and has been around for 500 years. And the mantra has always been, the dose makes the poison. Some things are very poisonous, even at low doses. Other things are poisonous at very high doses but everything is potentially poisonous. For example, if you drank 25 glasses of water in a row, you'd end up in the hospital because everything would be so dilute. Toxicology is complex. Multiple systems can be affected in the body, but the paradigm of toxicology is shifting because we now know that low doses of some chemicals can have effects that would not necessarily be predicted from their effects at high doses. This is strange, new, different, and certainly hard to understand. These responses are called non-monotonic, which means that more than one dose can make the poison. What this graph shows is that as the dose increases, so does the effect. It's what we call a linear graph. It is a consistent straight line, and it's also called a monotonic response. This slide is a comparison between the monotonic and the non-monotonic response. The non-monotonic response means that at low doses there can be an effect and then the effects seem to diminish but when the doses get high there's a toxic effect again. 
and these effects can be different from the lower ones. This pattern is the non-monotonic response. There is an effect at very low doses and then there are different toxic effects at very high doses. This graph is not a consistent straight line and it differs from what was understood by the old traditional toxicology paradigm. It's hard to understand how this can occur, but it is characteristic of hormones. Hormonally active drugs work like this too, an effect at low doses and then different effects at high doses. For example, doctors always try to prescribe the lowest dose of the birth control pill for this reason. There are also man-made polluting chemicals in the environment that seem to have hormone-like activity, and we call these chemicals hormone disruptors. Some pollutants disrupt hormone function and can do so in a variety of different ways, but one of the main mechanisms is to bind to receptors. Receptors are molecules on the surface of a cell that bind to a specific substance and cause a specific effect in the cell, like a key in a lock. For example, hormone A fits into a specific receptor. It has to be the right shape. Hormone B has a different shape, fits into a different receptor, and causes a different effect. It has to fit. Hormone disruptors are chemicals that can fit in the receptors and they disrupt normal hormone functioning in the body. So hormone disruptors are chemicals that interfere with hormone systems. One of the main mechanisms is that they combine with receptors. They can do other things. They can disrupt the production or the breakdown of hormones. But for the purpose of this lecture, understand that hormone disruptors bind to receptors. So at very low doses, a hormone disruptor can act as an agonist or activator or an antagonist, blocking and deactivating that receptor. They initiate changes in cell signaling and cell function accordingly. Even very low doses can stimulate cells to make more receptors on the surface. This enables the cell to better detect the chemical and will increase the cell's response as well. More receptors means it is easier to activate the cell and increases the cell's response. Higher doses can actually overwhelm the cell, which then tends to reduce the available receptors to try and shut down the response and balance things out. David Julius was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 2021 for his research in 1999 when he identified the receptor for something called capsaicin. Capsaicin is a natural pain reliever and the component of hot peppers that causes the sensation of heat. It's called the transient receptor potential vanilloid calcium channel or TRPV1 for short. You'll hear about this receptor a lot in this presentation. Why was this discovery so important? because it led to the discovery of a whole family of 28 similar channels or receptors called TRP, or Transient Receptor Potential Family of Receptors. This family of receptors transmits signals into cells in response to multiple chemical and physical stimuli. So in other words, David Julius' work led to our present understanding of the molecular basis of how nerves can change sensory stimulation into signals that can be sensed by the brain. These TRP receptors are described as polymodal, which means there's a variety of different kinds of physical and chemical stimulants which they can sense. So that image that I showed you before of a hormone having to fit exactly into a receptor in order to be able to generate a signal does not apply here. These particular TRP sensors are really complex and they can be stimulated by a variety of different things and they are exquisitely sensitive. These receptors enable the cell to read and respond to environmental changes. That's their job. They're involved in all the senses, including pain, heat, cold, odors, taste, hearing, and noxious stimuli. 
they have a fundamental role in cell signaling, including reading and responding to chemicals in the environment. Furthermore, they are widely distributed in many tissues and cell types in the nervous system, immune system, and other systems such as the cardiovascular, respiratory, and gastrointestinal systems. Two important members of the TRP family are TRPA1 and TRPV1 receptors. TRPA1 receptors are the most broadly tuned chemical receptor, which means they sense the most chemicals. More than 130 different chemicals have been identified as activators of TRPA1 receptors. TRPV1 receptors also sense multiple pollutants, such as numerous volatile organic compounds and particulate matter pollution. These are the receptors that were discovered because of their sensitivity to capsaicin. Repeated chronic activation of TRPV1 and TRPA1 receptors can lead to upregulation and sensitization. Upregulation is defined as an increase in the number of receptors on the cell surface. This enhances the cell's ability to read and respond to signals from the environment. And they can also become sensitized. Sensitization is defined as a reduced threshold and an increased response to stimulation. In other words, it doesn't take as much exposure to stimulate a stronger response. And when sensitized, receptors are hyperexcitable. They can perceive a signal as noxious, even if it is from a normal, usually innocuous stimulation. TRPV1 and TRPA1 receptors are extensively co-localized, which means that they reside very close to each other on the cell surface. In fact, 97% of neurons that have TRPA1 receptors on their surfaces also have TRPV1 receptors, and 30% of TRPV1 positive neurons also have coexisting TRPA1 receptors. They interact with each other. They can make each other more sensitized. In fact, their sensitization is dependent on being co-expressed with each other. As already mentioned, capsaicin is the ingredient in hot peppers that causes the sensation of heat. It's an odorless chemical that's been used in clinical research for more than 30 years. When it's inhaled, it can provoke coughing. More than 100 studies have been published using capsaicin inhalation challenges to study cough. We know that it's the TRPV1 receptors that sense and react to capsaicin. So in other words, the response to inhaling capsaicin reflects how reactive these particular receptors are in the respiratory tract. There are 18 studies published in the medical literature in which subjects with unexplained respiratory complaints allegedly triggered by low previously tolerated levels of exposures to common chemicals were challenged with capsaicin inhalation. In 14 of the 18 studies, the subjects also had headaches, lightheadedness, nausea, and or fatigue. Multiple systems were involved. They met the case definition for MCS. In nine of these studies, asthma was ruled out. All 18 studies demonstrated TRPV1 sensitization in people who met the definition of multiple chemical sensitivities compared to controls. There is one single blind challenge study of MCS subjects using acrolein, which stimulates TRPA1 receptors. And this study demonstrated sensitization in MCS patients compared to controls. The main source of acrolein is the combustion of fuels and organic matter like forest fires. It's also produced by industrial processes, incineration, strand board production, and coal generated electricity. But in Canadian homes, acrolein is actually higher inside than outside. One common source is tobacco smoke and e-cigarettes, but it also comes from cooking with oils or using gas stoves, wood smoke, 
and emissions from building materials like particle board and insulation. The half-life of acrolein is 14 hours, meaning that it takes 14 hours for half of it to be broken down. Acrolein stimulates TRPA1 receptors. MCS patients have sensitized TRPV1 and TRPA1 receptors, and these receptors are polymodal. They react to all kinds of stimulation. They're sensitive to a multitude of chemicals, especially volatile organic compounds, and they get sensitized by repeated exposure. So myth number three is that sensitization and reactions to structurally unrelated chemicals is not biologically explicable because it is biologically explicable. This image represents what a healthy detoxification system looks like. Toxins are substances called oxidants or free radicals or reactive oxygen nitrogen species. They're small molecules that can be toxic and cause damage to cells, but they can be neutralized by antioxidants in a healthy detoxification system. This is why you need to eat lots of fruits and vegetables because that's where antioxidants are found in high amounts. Detoxification can be inadequate for several reasons. It could be because of an abnormal genotype, an increased burden on the system from chemical exposures, or deficient nutritional support. The detoxification system is no longer in balance when the antioxidants are outweighed by the free radicals and toxins. When this occurs, there are measurable changes in the cell called oxidative stress. This leads to possible cell damage, including energy production, DNA structures, the epigenome, which is responsible for gene functioning, cell signaling like an MCS, or even cell death. Oxidative stress can lead to systemic inflammation, damage to tissues, and dysfunction of various organs. Higher levels of oxidative stress are found in individuals complaining of poor indoor air quality associated with sick building syndrome. And the amount of oxidative stress correlates with the levels of VOCs. Oxidative stress always occurs together with systemic inflammation, and both are sensed by TRPV1 and TRPA1 receptors. Both of these receptors are also activated by oxidative stress and systemic inflammation. Repeated chronic activation can lead to upregulation and sensitization. Oxidative stress and systemic inflammation are found in multiple chemical sensitivities. So, myth number four, symptom provocation from low dose exposures to common chemicals is not consistent with classical toxicology. In one sense, that's true, but that's because of the old paradigm of toxicology, which is now shifted. We now realize that the exposures in real life are mixtures of multiple chemicals. It's not just one chemical at a time. We know that low-dose, non-monotonic responses exist, that there can be more than one dose making the poison. We are now aware of systems toxicology, which means multiple systems are involved which can interact in a variety of different ways. So when we're looking for whether something is toxic or not, it depends on what you measure. We call these endpoints, and they can be multiple. We can measure oxidative stress or systemic inflammation or cell function or changes in receptors. Toxicology also involves low dose responses. That the monotonic response is the only toxicology paradigm is now the myth. Like everything else in our bodies, our ability to detoxify is affected by genetics. There are several variations, just like those influencing the color of our eyes or our height. And some genetic variations can reduce the capacity to metabolize and break down synthetic chemicals. If you don't detoxify well, it increases the oxidative stress. It enhances the toxic effects of long-term exposures and increases the risk for developing diseases linked to the environment. This genetic variation is more common in MCS, although it is not consistently found. But even in the absence of genetic variations for detoxification, 
oxidative stress, and systemic inflammation is still found in MCS. You don't have to have a genetic flaw for detoxification to develop MCS, but if you do, you're just more likely to get it. It's a risk factor. Several different genetic variations have also been identified for TRPV1 receptors. And some can actually increase the sensitivity to capsaicin, or their expression on the cell membrane, or the excitability of the nerve cell. And these genetic variants are also associated with how easily the TRPV1 and TRPA1 receptors can become sensitized to chemicals and enhance the perception of odors. This suggests that these genetic variations would predispose people to developing MCS, but as yet, there are no studies published that have looked. Clearly, more research is required. Systematic reviews are studies in which scientists try to answer a question by using a transparent, comprehensive, and systematic approach to gather all the pertinent scientific literature to objectively comprehend what the science actually states. Systematic reviews of studies using functional brain scan imaging in patients with MCS found differences in brain activity in MCS patients compared to controls. Differences are observed during and after exposures. Sensory processing is altered neurologically after exposures. The conclusions of two systematic reviews is that MCS patients process odors differently, that this is a neurogenic process and it is influenced by attention bias, which I will explain a bit later. It is important to know that the substances used in these functional brain scan imaging studies were stimulants of TRPV1 or TRPA1 receptors, because the regions in the brain that responded express these receptors. The sensitization of these receptors helps to explain the differences in how MCS patients respond compared to healthy controls. And this provides additional evidence for a biological cause for MCS. That is the sensitization of these receptors, which can sense chemicals. So myth number five is that MCS cannot be explained by known mechanisms. MCS is complex. There are multiple linked pathophysiological mechanisms, including oxidative stress and systemic inflammation, sensitization of receptors that sense chemicals, and abnormal neuroprocessing of odors. Sensitization has been demonstrated in the nervous system, which is the most common system involved, and the respiratory system, which is the second most commonly impacted system. The mechanisms are shared with other comorbid or co-occurring disorders such as chronic cough and chronic pain disorders like migraines. Attention bias implies that one's attention has shifted towards information perceived as threatening. It's the tendency to prioritize the processing of certain stimuli over others. It affects the ability to disengage attention away or ignore that stimulus. The processing of threat-related information is fast and involves certain areas of the brain such as the limbic system or prefrontal cortex, both of which express TRPV1 and TRPA1 receptors. It's a biological response and is very common in anxiety disorders. But if the threat is real, it's not an anxiety disorder. People with MCS have faster reaction times and have difficulties ignoring chemical exposures. They do not habituate or get used to odors compared to controls. The perception of the intensity does not decrease with time. The attention systems in MCS are biased to identify and discriminate chemical odors from what is referred to as the background noise of odors. MCS people prioritize processing chemical odors and they do so to avoid the exposures because the perception of threat is real. 90% of people with MCS report a hypersensitive sense of smell. But in contrast, multiple studies repeatedly have shown that the thresholds to detect odors are not different. 
This discrepancy can be explained by attention bias. MCS people identify and discriminate odors from background noise due to attention bias. The statement that MCS patients do not have a hypersensitive ability to detect threatening odors is a myth. One of the case criteria for the diagnosis of MCS is that multiple systems are involved. TRPV1 and TRPA1 receptors are widely spread in the brain and respiratory systems. They're also frequently co-expressed in the conjunctiva and cornea, larynx, urinary bladder, upper and lower gastrointestinal system, and the cardiovascular system. They're involved in multiple physiological and pathophysiological functions in all of these systems. For example, the TRPV1 receptor is involved in the mechanisms of functional dyspepsia, or upset stomach, and irritable bowel syndrome, both of which are frequently comorbid with MCS. Inhaling capsaicin provokes cough. Coughing is preceded by the perception of an irritation, the urge to cough. The sensation of an urge to cough is associated with changes in a variety of areas of the brain, which happen to be very similar to the areas of the brain activated when pain is elicited. The pathways for pain and urge to cough overlap. This has been demonstrated by something called conditioning pain modulation, which means if you have pain somewhere and you apply a painful stimulus to a different part of the body, you actually reduce the pain felt in the first location. One source of pain is able to inhibit another because they use the same pathway. Using conditioning pain modulation, one can reduce the cough response to capsaicin inhalation by applying pain, such as a painful pressure to the thumb. This is because pain and cough use the same specific brain regions. Cough, chronic pain disorders such as fibromyalgia and migraine, and multiple chemical sensitivities are associated with each other because of shared mechanisms in the brain. This table lists 13 different mechanisms, almost all of which are shared by chronic migraine, asthma, and multiple chemical sensitivities. They include air pollution, genotype for detoxification, being triggered by chemical exposures, oxidative stress, systemic inflammation, chronic pain, central sensitization, which is a sensitization of sensory areas of the brain, impaired cognition, upregulation of TRPV1 and TRPA1 receptors, low levels of vitamin D, mast cell activation, mast cells or cells of the immune system, and associated psychiatric disorders. No association has been found for detoxification genotypes and chronic migraine, and there are no studies of vitamin D and MCS. But this table shows that there's almost a complete overlap between these three conditions, and this is because they share mechanisms. Multiple chemical sensitivity shares mechanisms with other comorbid biological conditions. The multiple organ response is consistent with TRPV1 and TRPA1 receptor sensitization and the location of where these receptors are expressed. So the statement that it is just a misperception to attribute multiple symptoms from multiple systems to exposures to low levels of chemicals is a myth. Association means the two conditions are statistically more likely to occur together. One condition could be a risk factor for another. MCS, neurodegeneration, cough, asthma, fibromyalgia, and chronic migraine are all associated with psychiatric conditions. Mental health conditions increase the risk for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, asthma, and arthritis, and they're associated with cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, and neurodegenerative disorders, diabetes, and cancer. But they're clearly not the cause. Psychiatric comorbidity is a risk factor for many disorders. It contributes to disease severity, functional limitations, and increased use of the healthcare system. The odds are increased for having a mood disorder or being severely distressed if you have MCS. Seven studies have been published which found higher rates of a lifetime history of psychiatric conditions in people with MCS.
Two studies found an 80% likelihood. Three found the chances to be about 50-50. And two found a probability of about 30%, which also means that 70% of the MCS patients did not. None of these studies considered that the symptoms used to make the psychiatric diagnoses could be explained by a biological response to chemicals. Whether psychiatric disorders precede or follow the onset of MCS is inconsistent. In fact, developing MCS can precede the onset of mental health symptoms. To decide whether something is a cause of a condition, researchers use specific criteria famously known as the Bradford Hill criteria. One of those criteria is temporality, which is the only one upon which it is universally agreed that the onset of a condition cannot occur before the cause. If the onset of MCS occurs before developing a subsequent psychiatric condition, how can MCS be caused by an anxiety or mood disorder? Many papers have been published recommending psychotherapy or psychotherapeutic medications as a treatment for MCS. Suggested treatments include cognitive behavioral therapy or relaxation therapy with deconditioning, meaning gradual increasing exposures to chemicals. Antidepressants like paroxetine have been recommended too. However, the level of evidence in support of these recommendations is almost non-existent and based on only a few case reports published in the last 30 years. So myth number eight is that the evidence for psychiatric causation in MCS is strong. The studies suggesting an association of MCS with psychiatric conditions are mostly cross-sectional, meaning that they're making comparisons at a single point in time after the development of MCS and causality cannot be implied from these studies. Association does not mean causation. Developing MCS can precede the onset of mental symptoms and many people with MCS do not meet the criteria for a mental disorder. It's a myth that the evidence for psychiatric causation is strong. It's weak. The National Institute of Public Health Quebec, the INSPQ, used poor methodology which biased their conclusion that MCS is caused by anxiety. They failed to consider the multiple studies that TRPV1 and TRPA1 receptors can become sensitized to multiple chemicals. They ignored the numerous studies showing sensitization of these receptors in MCS. They misinterpreted the brain scan studies, ignoring the fact that TRPV1 and TRPA1 stimulants were used and caused changes in areas of the brain where these receptors are expressed. Myth number nine is that provocation of symptoms from chemical exposures is a conditioned response. A conditioned response is a learned response to a stimulus which was previously neutral. The first and most famous example is Pavlov's experiment in which he trained dogs to salivate for food at the sound of a ringing bell. Several papers have been published suggesting that MCS is a conditioned response. The evidence is based on studies that the stress response can be conditioned to specific odors, which were performed using healthy young adults. The authors then conclude without any evidence that this is the mechanism for MCS. No published studies have ever demonstrated conditioning in MCS. And there have been just three cases reviewed in the last 25 years using deconditioning with biofeedback as a treatment. That MCS patients would be better off if they increased their chemical exposures is a myth. There is no evidence that this is effective and no evidence that it's safe. MCS patients followed for up to 10 years using capsaicin inhalation challenge testing show no reduction in sensitivity. Encouraging people with chemical sensitivity to increase exposures could make them more sensitive, which would be iatrogenic, meaning an illness caused by the treatment. These are the top 10 facts concerning MCS. MCS does exist. 
there's an accepted consensus definition for MCS. Reactions to structurally unrelated chemicals is biologically explicable. Symptom provocation from low dose exposures to common chemicals is consistent with modern toxicology. MCS can be explained by known pathophysiological mechanisms. MCS patients can detect odors more quickly. Attributing multiple symptoms to low level chemical exposures is not a misperception. The evidence for psychiatric causation in MCS is weak. Decreasing chemical exposures is the best management strategy. And last but not least, MCS patients have a medical disability with the legal right to accommodation. Thank you.